Council number nine, the people of the state of New York versus Vladimir Duarte. Council will take a moment so that your colleagues can collect their things. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Molly Schindler, on behalf of Vladimir Duarte, I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, please. You may. Thank you. May it please the Court. I would love to go pro se is an unequivocal pro se request that required the trial court to begin a McIntyre inquiry. It had no caveats. It had no conditions. It had no limitations. It was not made in the alternative to any other request. It was timely and it was unambiguous. This, the trial court's failure to conduct any inquiry into that request necessitates reversal under a long line of this court's precedent since McIntyre. The request that he made when he said, I would love to Council, go can I se. just, uh, excuse me, Happy New Year. Just wanted to ask you, uh, just for clarification, your, your view of the appellate court's uh, decision on, on its first basis, not the alternative basis, on the first basis. Did the appellate court find that yeah, it was clear, but in context, it's not what he meant, versus no, it is unclear given this context. How, how do you read the appellate court's determination? I read its determination that it couldn't be unequivocal. It, the request couldn't have been unequivocal because it came in the context of expressing dissatisfaction with his trial attorney, which simply is not the law. It has never been uh, this court's holding, and in fact, uh, this court has repeatedly recognized that one of the primary reasons a defendant chooses to go pro se um, is because of dissatisfaction or distrust with his assigned attorney, particularly with an indigent defendant who does not have choice of counsel, cannot afford to replace his attorney if he's dissatisfied. So and counsel, how do you read that colloquy? It, before we get to, I would love to go pro se. Do you read that colloquy? Well, do, let me just, is it that he's saying my counsel's ineffective he doesn't believe I'm innocent, therefore I don't want him give me substitute counsel, or I just don't want him. How do you read that part of the colloquy? Well, he doesn't ask for a new counsel. He doesn't ask for substitute counsel. He certainly makes clear that he doesn't want this person. He's dissatisfied with this person. But what he doesn't do is then say, and therefore give me someone else. So you can certainly make an inference that that might have been what he was interested in. You can also make an inference that what he wanted was what he went on to say explicitly, that he wanted to represent himself instead. But you can't rely on that inference, even if you believe that what he was looking for was new counsel at that point in time. You can't rely on an inference over what he went on to say explicitly and unambiguously that he wanted to proceed pro se. So, Counsel, what deference do we give to the trial judge here to interpret the defendant's demeanor, his facial expressions, and things of that nature when it's unfolding right in front of the trial judge? What? Well, she didn't give us any information about her reasoning. She simply ignored the request and moved on to the suppression hearing and shut it down in, in no uncertain terms. So she didn't give us the ability to see if that she was making any kind of finding. Um, and without any information from her, we have to take his words at face value because they are, they are plainly in the record. Can we infer she didn't think it was serious? We, we can't infer that, Your Honor, because she, she didn't give us any reason for that. But it also wouldn't have been, there was no indication on the record that would allow us to make that conclusion that it wasn't serious either. For example, in People v. Laval or Lavai. Did he tell um, her he loved her at one point? <laughs> Yes, and, and, and later on in the transcript, he did, he did say that. Um, he, he was a very active self-advocate throughout this process. Uh, but, but she was required, when it comes to a constitutional invocation, um, especially when the standard is unequivocality and an unequivocal statement is made, it needs to be taken at face value. And it leads to at least to the point of begun, beginning an inquiry. And I want to emphasize that the court was not required to grant a pro se request. The court was required merely to get to step two. Don't just deny it without any inquiry whatsoever. You have to do the inquiry. And it could be that during the inquiry, it comes out that what he's actually looking for is a new lawyer. And at that point, you know, maybe he says, well, just give me a new lawyer and I'll be fine. Then the court is happy, is, is fine to stop the inquiry. That's similar to what happened in Silburn um, from 2018. Could, could the request have been as simple as, are you serious? Could, could the inquiry? It certainly could have. I mean, the inquiry in Silburn was, you want to represent yourself? 
And the defendant's response to that revealed that he actually didn't want to represent himself. He was looking for dual representation. And this court held that there, there was no further searchery, searching inquiry needed at that point. That would have been very acceptable here. Or if the court could have done the full inquiry, if Mr. Duarte maintained that he did in fact want to represent himself, but the court could have then concluded after the inquiry that it was not, um, that he was being too disruptive or obstreperous or that he was being disingenuous or manipulative in making that request. The court was entitled to, within her discretion, conclude that, but only after doing the inquiry. And McIntyre was very clear on that point. The failure to do any inquiry whatsoever was reversible error. Thank you, Thank you. counsel. Thank counsel? you. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Your Honors. Jeannie Campbell Urban for the people of the state of New York. Um, this court has, has made very clear that a defendant cannot use a request for self-representation as leverage to compel the court to grant its un the defendant's underlying request for a reassignment of assigned counsel. It's clear from both the immediate context of the defendant's reference to self-representation as well as the record as a whole that that is what was going on in this case. Well, the and trial judge didn't have the record as a whole, right? The trial judge just had what was in front of her. She was in the trial part. She just got this defendant. That's correct. The, this was the first time that this defendant had appeared before this particular judge. Um, I would say that the immediate context that the judge had just with respect to interacting with the defendant about what um, I think is very obviously his request for substitute counsel, um, I think told the court a lot about the defendant and gave her some context with which she could interpret his subsequent reference to self-representation. But also... why is that? Why, why is that? I'm sorry, here. Happy New Year. Hi. Happy New Year. What? So, so he's explaining there's this colloquy. He's saying, my lawyer's in effect. That's his allegation. And the judge is saying, no, it doesn't look like it. He continues on that same point. And then the judge makes it expressly clear because denies it. There is no actual request for a substitution, so just denies. And then he tries to proceed and she says, stop talking or you can't speak. And then his next point is, I, I, wanna, I would love to go pro se. I mean, uh, proceed pro se, excuse me. So it seems to me that there's been a break once the court is, let's assume you're correct about the first part and expressly made a denial on the record that now we've moved on to something else. I, I just don't see how it's all sort of this uh, one experience. It, it's happening at, at the same time. I don't deny that. You're absolutely correct, and it may be moving very fast-paced. But you've got a denial, and you've got the judge saying you can't speak, and, and you've got this request. It strikes me that at a minimum, the judge should do at least what Judge Wilson and, and counsel are suggesting, say, I, I just want to be clear. Are you now saying you want to go pro se? What is it? I mean, this is a constitutional right. Doesn't it make sense that that's the way McIntyre anticipates the court should proceed? Well, McIntyre requires a prong two inquiry only if the prong one is met, a, a timely and unequivocal request for self-representation. Yes, but I guess I'm asking if, if a judge is not certain or, right, the, sort of on its face, it, it sounds clear and unambiguous. I, I would love to proceed pro se, but a judge thinks, mm, I'm not so sure this is really what they mean. Isn't that where you should inquire? Your Honor, if on its face, as, it said that. If you disagree with me and you think that the request is clear and unequivocal, then yes, there has to be an inquiry. But in, as recently as Silburn, this court has said when the defendant is not being unambiguous, when he is not being clear, clarifying questions, in addition to an inquiry, neither of those things is constitutionally required. And it's So what in, what in your view would have made this record clear? If, if, if saying I would love to proceed pro se, in your view, is not clear and unambiguous, what would he have had to say? Let's say that is really his intent, that is really what he's trying to request. How would he have expressed that to the court so that we all wouldn't be here? Your, Your Honor, I, 
am willing to admit that if, the def if this phrase came out of the mouth of a different defendant who wasn't disruptive, who hadn't just failed to get substitute counsel, which is what he really wanted, that it's a much closer question with respect to whether the phrase, I would love to go pro se, amounts to a clear and unequivocal request that gets you to prong to the inquiry. But in this case, it's... Yeah, but even in McIntyre, remember McIntyre discusses some of the reasons that might motivate a defendant to seek to proceed pro se, and one of them is very obviously dissatisfaction of with counsel, I mean, absolutely, isn't but that not. usually what happens? You're on. It wouldn't it be the rare case. I mean, first of all, you have the rare case where someone wants to proceed pro se. But okay, the rare case where someone is thrilled with their lawyer's representation says, "But you know what? I I want to do it alone. I I don't need legal training for this." I mean, the reality is, you're unhappy with this lawyer. You may have other reasons, and and you ask the court to proceed pro se. McIntyre absolutely acknowledges that some defendants definitively commit to self-representation out of dissatisfaction with their lawyer. But this court's much more recent cases have acknowledged that there is a difference between that situation and a situation where the defendant raises the specter of self-representation as a means to a different end. Particularly, Laval, Jillian, and Kathleen Kay all look at situations where the defendant raises self-representation as a way to manipulate the court into granting what he really wants, a new lawyer. That yes, but in happens. those cases, it's very obvious that they are looking for something else. Either they've okay. already been denied the request, and so they're, they're now saying, well, then I have no choice. I want to do this, so they're trying to push the envelope on that. Um, Your Honor, it's or, they, or they present it in the alternative that you, you have, in this case, a denial of the request, and then you've moved on to a different request. Well, the defendant, I think the defendant's constant interruptions, his constant disruptions, um, and again, this was an experienced criminal defendant with contempt convictions, in fact, one very yeah. recent contempt yeah. conviction. How many, is, how many is constant disruptions, by the way? He, if you look at the proceedings before, I think he made, I think, four appearances where he was present before he appeared before the trial court. Yeah, but we're worried about before this judge. Where, oh, I, where, what's I the disruption sure before this meant, judge? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not being clear. At the suppression hearing, that's the colloquy because that's when he, what, that's when he asks. How, how many times is he disruptive, according to the cold record? I, she, he says, my lawyer is ineffective. I don't want him representing anymore. She mm -hmm. says denied. He tries okay. to read something into the record. She tells him right. not to speak. He tries right. to speak again. And that, yes, that's the point he asked for, to be pro se. So, so one is I think it's, I think it's at least three um, yeah. interjections mm -hmm. subsequent to her denial of the request for substitute counsel. Okay. I think that that tells you that this defendant is, is, has not moved on. He is not taking no for an answer, and he is looking for a way to get the court to reconsider its ruling. He's looking for a way to manipulate the court into granting what he really wants, which is a new lawyer. And I, I bring up the, the experience of the defendant in the criminal justice system, specifically his contempt convictions, because I think that, that also supports this interpretation of the record. He was not shy in, in continuing to demand what he wanted, looking for a way to get it, even in the face of a denial from the court. Once a defendant expresses dissatisfaction with counsel. Are, is there a different set of words the defendant needs to use beyond, I would love to go pro se, to, to trigger the inquiry? Your Honor, what's required is a, a clear and unequivocal request, but what that looks like, I think, does I know, depend on the circumstances. You seem to be saying that if, if the defendant hadn't expressed any dissatisfaction with counsel and had just made the request, I would love to go pro se, you would say there should be at least an inquiry. At, at, are you serious? Do you really want to do that and go from there? I would ask for more context if I could know it. What's the tone mm -hmm. of the person's voice and what else was going on if it wasn't? Yeah, but those are things that we can't review. Well, right? so that's we, a great point. But, but we have to be able to review these, right? So we have to do it on the record that we have. I, I, that's true. So I think that I guess also... what I'm asking is if we have had a record here in which the defendant hadn't. I, I take your view to be that if a defendant expresses dissatisfaction with counsel, 
there's more that the defendant needs to say to be able to trigger the initial inquiry than if the defendant hadn't said that. I think that's fair. I okay, think that's so fair. I think those circumstances. What, what words would have worked? Well, again, I think that's a difficult question because yeah. it all depends on the context. I mean, here you have a defendant who has shown himself to be disruptive, who has shown himself to be someone who doesn't really um, listen to instructions to stop speaking. I think that the, the so those these, might be good reasons to deny him self-representation. I th I think th I think that's true, but I also think that that tells you something about what the defendant is willing to do to accomplish what he wants. I think that tells you that this defendant is willing to manipulate the proceedings. Um, Counsel, do you think the words "I want to go pro se" versus "I would love to go pro se" do you see a difference there? I do see a difference, and I would point out that when the defendant asked to waive a jury trial and, and proceed to a bench trial, he said, I would, uh, he said, sorry, he said, I want to do this trial by judge, not jury, please. I do think that there is a distinction between I would love and I want. So and do you when, think that, so when, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. And do you think we should as ascribe any relevance to the fact that this defendant never mentioned it again. I absolutely do. I mean, look at how, look at how much this defendant talked after making the single reference to self-representation. He interjected a lot. At one point, he told the judge that he loved her. He wasn't shy about speaking up, and he never said a thing about going pro se ever again. I, I also so just related I, to that. I wrote down the first words that Ms. Schindler said, which were, I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, please. Did you understand it to be equivocal, or she was asking for two minutes? Uh, that's, that's funny. I must not have even heard that. Um, again, I, I would say that context matters. Like, she's the appellant. She's we know she's court, asking for rebuttal. That's somewhat differ deferential to say to a court, I would like, because she's asking for permission. I right? think that's one just way as, to interpret just it. Just as Mr. Duarte was. I'm sorry? Just as Mr. Duarte was. I, I, think, that, I think that you are making assumptions about his tone that we don't know. I think it's just as possible that he was being flip and sarcastic. I would point you to the fact that the trial judge chose not to engage with him, which, as Your Honor said, is an indication that he wasn't being serious and that she could tell that from his tone, in addition to the fact that he had already proven himself to be disruptive. Um, I just wanted to um, follow up on the question Your Honor asked me about the defendant's failure to raise the subject of self-representation ever again. Just one last thought I wanted to share about that is that the, the fact that the judge chose not to engage with the defendant means that she didn't actually even ever tell him no. It, you know, to the extent that he was asking to represent himself, she just said nothing. Especially under those circumstances, common sense would dictate that if he truly was committed to self-representation, he would have said something at some other point, and he never did that. That is just more support um, for the conclusion that the trial court correctly interpreted his comment um, as a non-serious, flippant remark and that it was not an unequivocal request to exercise this constitutional right. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, you're above. Your Honor, the respondent is, an, is asking you to engage in the exact same mind-reading exercise that she would like trial courts to engage in when they're confronted with an un unambiguous statement on its face. I would love to go pro se. Um, you need to make a lot of inferences and a lot of assumptions that are not in the record in order to interpret his request as anything but what he said. Um, the words, I would love to go pro se, are, have the same meaning when they're not accompanied by any kind of any if, a but, and unless, and if not. When you say, I would love to take you out to dinner, you are, exp I, you are expressing your desire and intent to take that person out to dinner, unless you say, if I weren't busy tonight, for example. The, statements, the statement alone, those words alone, are exactly the same as saying, I want to go pro se. That request on its own was enough, and that the court needed to stop there uh, in terms of engaging in that inquiry, even if it was just a single question. Um, the court didn't have access to anything that happened later, so in terms of giving guidance to the trial courts on um, how they need to act when they're confronted in a similar situation, they, they won't have the luxury of reviewing the whole record to see, oh, is he going to bring it up again? I'm not sure. What they need to do is interpret the words that are in front of them, not try to 
be, become a mind reader to figure out do you actually mean the words that you said or not. Um, the time to do that is during the inquiry in prongs two and three. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.